Hello there and welcome to a very special edition of Tub Talk, the podcast for IT consultants. I'm your host, Richard Tubb, but unusually, today's episode won't really feature me at all, which may be a major bonus for some of you long-time listeners. Let me explain. Now, during 2022, we celebrated International Women's Day by producing a wonderful series of interviews with some of the most amazing women working in technology. In fact, you can still listen to our Women in Tech series on your favorite podcast player, and you can download the Women in Tech ebook we produced from tub.co forward slash women in tech. Well, two of the most popular episodes we've recorded were the interviews with Vera Tucci, an Italian MSP owner, and Emily Glass, who is the CEO of MSP Vendor Synchro. Now, a few weeks ago, I had dinner with Vera Tucci in London, and Vera mentioned to me that after she listened to the episode with Emily Glass that we produced, uh, Vera reached out to her, to Emily, that is, and struck up a friendship. In fact, Vera said she wishes she had recorded her conversation with Emily because it was packed with so many amazing insights. Well, long-time listeners to this podcast will know that the whole reason I started Tub Talk, the podcast for IT consultants, is that I was having some amazing conversations with some of the smartest, most successful people in our space. And at the end of those conversations, I always wish I'd recorded them to share with you. So that's actually how the podcast got started. So what I suggested to Vera was that the next time she spoke with Emily, that they record the conversation and we could use it as a very special episode of Tub Talk. Therefore, in today's episode, I'm going to be handing things over to Vera Tucci and Emily Glass so you can hear their conversation on topics such as dealing with the changes to business due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the challenges of recruiting smart talent for your MSP business, how to communicate clearly with your clients, how to build a strong company culture, and so much more. Now, this episode is full of value bombs from both Vera and Emily, so peel your ears back and listen to this very special episode of Vera Tucci speaking with Emily Glass. We said so many things last time that... I know, we should have recorded that one. Do you remember what you said? You say that again. I'll try to remember what I said. <laughs> well, let me go back to that. I don't, I don't remember, but it was really smart. <laughs> and your questions were great. And it felt like an interview and it felt like we trained for it, but we didn't. So I think that we can easily replicate another fantastic moment without okay. being too prepared. Otherwise, it's yes. going to sound like an interview and and it's not going to be authentic. Sure. Sounds right? good. Yeah, this is definitely <laughs> authentic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because you had no preparation for it. Ta-da. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been put on the spot before. Let's see. I've, I've practiced for this moment. <laughs> <laughs> you trained your whole career for a moment like this. No, I'm just yeah. kidding. Last time it was great, though, because I was asking you a ton of questions about being an MSP and the growth of your business and how you got from early stages and stand now I'm remembering standardized to yeah you know to what you do today which is more targeting like the co-managed and working with IT admins instead of small business owners and yeah we had we had some great conversation there exactly. I'm sure a lot of other MSPs would benefit from but okay well on to a new topic to that. <laughs> yeah. but I mean <laughs> Our lives kind of uh, they, they go around this topic of how do you do things how do you manage your work environment, how do you uh, interact with your co-workers and your clients and partners? And I think we all go through the same things. One of the greatest thing about attending an event in a new environment, because London for me was a new environment, was meeting new people, new MSPs from a different market, companies that are way bigger than mine or with um, uh, you know an Asian history and, and different traditions, but we all go through the same things. We are all facing the same challenges, finding good people to work with, smart technicians to train and um, attract the, the talents and creating that environment that doesn't push us away people screaming and running out of the door. Um, and we are all talking about the same things, like what is your approach to this yeah. matters. So 
Yeah, and on top of it, it's interesting because MSPs, I think MSPs and vendors in the space and companies of all sizes too, but you know, we're talking about the MSP space specifically, have a similar challenge. And it's even harder today because you're trying to attract talent, you're trying to create a good culture, and you're also trying to serve customers and be a profitable business. Exactly. And even today, it's harder because of everything happening in society, because of the stress, because people are working from home and there's this blend of personal and professional, people even more want to like find purpose in their work yeah. and have, have fun or have meaning in, through their work yeah. um, because we spend so much time there. But it's so much more challenging to balance that with like profits yes. and the need to run a business and make hard decisions and explain those hard decisions <laughs> when it don't make sense. Like it's not something you would do to your family or, you know, you wouldn't fire that customer you know, exactly. if you loved them or it's, it's a very tricky uh, path to navigate these days for sure. Absolutely. Especially when you think about all the challenges that come with cybersecurity. I was talking to one of my coworkers earlier today and we were talking about the fact that, as an MSP or an MSSP, depends on what kind of approach you want to have. We internally, we start from a very um, high pressure environment. It's just the nature of our job is that we need to be on the edge of our seats and we need to be reactive and we need to be uh, prepared for everything and we need to stay calm so that our clients can stay calm when they need us. So the I think that our responsibility as leaders or, you know, in a more traditional way, owners or um, employees, employers, is that we need to do everything we can to, you know, kind of make the work environment better and calmer and with um, a more, I think, human friendly mm -hmm. approach because our job is already stressful and is already risky. And we need to take responsibilities for so many things that if we don't put our best selves forward, people are gonna resist a few months in our companies and we are gonna start again the uh, recruitment process and the hiring process. And, and that's a lot, a lot of time that we waste and a lot of money that we waste, but how how can we do it? How should we do it? And, and you manage a team that is almost completely remote, right? I, I heard that. Remote. Yeah, 100% and Richard, remote. And I, I'm this. identifying with a lot of what you're saying. It's actually making me remember my time at Datto okay. because we did backup, right? A lot of the time that I was there, I worked on the backup product and disaster recovery. So you're talking about you know security. Uh, backup is a piece of that. Um, and it's also high stakes, right? When, yeah. when partners called in and wanted to do a recovery, that was, you know, half of the calls. It was either deploy, deploy the solution or help me, like something's on fire, maybe <laughs> literally on fire. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just high stress. And it was really hard. And you're making me think of, and then you're saying like, how do we create this caring environment, kind of calming to balance that out? Because um, you know, no one, no one's going to die. We're not surgeons. We're not on a, you know, there's no, right. there's no people whose lives are at risk usually, although sometimes with natural disasters there are, uh, but uh, it's almost like, you know, the second level down where people's businesses are at risk, right? Exactly. Um, and their livelihoods. So that is naturally very stress inducing. And one of the first things we did, um, just hearing you talk made me think of of one of the first things we did at Datto Tech Support. So we had this scenario where partners were calling in for a disaster recovery, right? Which is like the highest stress kind of call you can take. Um, and we had those calls routing randomly to technicians when I started. Just anybody could get that call. So it could be a new hire who, you know, just got through their training and the first call they get, maybe assisted by someone uh, or maybe not if they were, you know, a few days in, was a high stress disaster recovery where they're now stressed because exactly it's the first thing for the first time for them and they're you know learning new things and, and dealing with their emotions. It's a stress for the partner who's like, I need expert guidance right now. And I have a customer yelling at me or you know who is upset or needs me. Um, and it was like the worst possible storm <laughs> for, for stress. 
So yeah. I think when you ask what can we do, I think we can design our processes to um, to make workflows that help like avoid the highest stress situations. Hmm. So what, the way that we solve that is uh, we devised a solution and said, okay, these kind of tickets are, we know they're going to be high stress. We're going to call them code red and hmm. we're going to have a code red team. And it's going to be not new hires, not people, you know, who are not specialists in recovery. We're going to train, give people extra training. We're going to give them extra support. We might even give them extra time off to, you know, recover from the stress. And we said, look, these people, if they get really good at it, we're going to want to keep them on this team all the time because they're going to become experts. But it's important to cycle them off to give them time away to avoid that burnout that you're talking about. Yeah. So there's ways to like, you know, I think it might depend on a case by case basis, what exactly the stress is that you're dealing with. But I think making sure people are trained and have the skills to cope with the situation, get breaks, get the support that they need while they're doing the job, um, whether that's a supervisor, you know, or a skills or just more longer break away after a tough call. Um, there's things we can do to help um, mitigate the long-term effects of stressful situations. But is that what you were, you were, does that relate to you a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think that hiring the right people was already an issue in tech companies, because as you said, we need to have people that are skilled or maybe prepared to face those kind of challenges. But right now there's this shortage of good people that we can hire or people in general. There's um, a, tons of people quitting their jobs, you know, the, the great resignation or the quiet quitting phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And we MSPs, and I say we because lots of people told me they're going through the same thing. We cannot hire them fast enough. Like we are growing so much. And if we need to uh turn over those red teams uh we need to have more people that we can work with it's not just you can have the specific amount of people that you need you need a bigger team because you need to um plan for extra time off or for more flexible days and whatever it is that you're gonna choose as your go-to process but these kind of people are not that easy to find, or maybe they're not easy to find at all because I think it goes back to the pandemic. It kind of lowered our tolerance for stressful situations. Yes, because and we have this regular background noise of stress uh, running yes. through our lives, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And, and maybe we, we will need as an industry one year of, or maybe even two to kind of go back to a normal uh, a, a normal flow of people coming in and, and people uh, changing their their job uh, or re resigning from our companies because right now it's like we are in constant search of amazing, smart, ready, prepared people to work with. And none of us seem to find what they're looking for. Yeah, it, it's really a challenge. Um, even, you know, on the vendor side, I can relate to that, um, you know, because I've had to hire a lot of tech support people at, at Synchro, at, at Datto, um, and other, other companies. And um, it really brings back the thought about, you know, profit versus quality of life question, because, you know, there's a standard kind of, and there's a standard rule of thumb, at least from what I've seen, if you just do tech support, you know, in a regular way or high stress, you know, jobs, um, turnover is like every two years, like someone yeah. can last about two years in the same job in that stress. And then, you know, doing the same things, routine things, and then they kind of like burnt out and they want to do something else and they leave. Um, the only antidotes to that, that I found, and, and it worked at, at Datto, for example, is career path. So development, mm. so making sure that the tasks don't stay the same, that they change over time, that they get more complex or maybe more in the direction of the career path the person wants to go. So it could be more technically complex, more of a managerial complexity. You know, there's different ways to make it uh, varied um, or uh, you find a way to make the quality of life better. 
so that it doesn't lead to burnout. Um, but both of those, I think, require an investment that impacts your efficiency or your profitability, right? So I wonder, I wonder from your perspective, when you're looking for talent, um, how do you think about training? Because that's a kind of investment where if you found the person with the right like um, interpersonal skills mm-hmm. and personality to handle stress, you could probably train them on the technical, but yeah. that's an investment. Right. So how how do you make that choice, especially at a small MSP? I I think it depends on the the moment in time when I'm hiring. In the past, I always went for the personal skills first. And I was okay with investing time and energy into creating those kind of um hard skills and technical skills that that we needed. Right now, it's not about us not wanting to invest that kind of time it's about we cannot afford it in terms of our presence for our clients we need to grow and react at such a pace that I cannot afford to invest six months into training a person or a group of people before um providing that service or before expanding my my operational hours this is a very recent issue we have a few clients that are expanding their business hours and they are requesting us to expand our support hours early in the morning late at night over weekends if i find the right person on the the soft skill side I cannot afford to train that person to provide my clients with that extra support. I need to find maybe uh, an average uh, skilled person with a good personal potential, but I need somebody that is ready to go and that is um, okay with jumping in and, and be of help right away because our clients are changing so fast and they are... Um, and they are answering their clients and their supply chain. So it's um, everything has changed in the last two years, I believe. I, I can see a difference in the the, um, the kind of demand that our clients have. Um, we spent so many years training them and um, organizing events and conferences to 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 teach them what our job was and to help them understand the value of what we do and now that they fully understand it and the pandemic helped us in in this sense because they they are completely aware of what we do and how important our job is they can get enough they want more they want more hours they want more support they want more people there for them i i have a very skilled colleague of mine he's an an amazing senior technician and he took the classical two weeks vacation time because in Italy this is a must-have you those two weeks are non-negotiable and it's good for them that they can have that time off one of the clients that he's personally serving was in shock like how am I going to do for two weeks? Like we have a whole team. (laughs) It's not just this person. We have other people that can help you. But clients are feeling more and more that they depend on us and what we do to function properly and to, uh, you know, Mm. operate in the right way. Um, So I think that right now we see the, the need of, we feel the need of hiring a person that is, just at that average technical level so that they can scale immediately. Yeah. Yeah. And, but it has an average attitude towards the stress and, and the kind of personality that the MSP industry needs so that we can work on both. And we, we try to work on both because sometimes you find amazing people that are very young. They haven't worked in a structured environment before. So you, you need to train them not on their personal skills, but on the way that they can leverage those skills mm-hmm. to work in a business environment. Like you have this set of 
potential or these areas that you need to work on. But why do you need to work on those things in in our com- within our company? Because this is, um, I think, another element of our generation is that we are working with Gen Zs and millennials and all kind of <laughs> all kind of ages, and people are so different between yeah. each other. They yeah. they have different views on on work, on responsibility, on um, the the time frame that they need to be uh, available. Yeah. yeah, you said so many things there that like I I uh, that resonated with me or that I found interesting, especially how that technician was almost like an extension of yeah. the customer's yes. workforce like almost like how could you let that person go on vacation without <laughs> asking me <laughs> exactly <laughs> like, who do they work for yeah but that shows that you're building really a lot of trust with your customers that they feel like that's that's their employee almost right like or that's that's part of their company yes uh, so that that's the good thing i think all a lot of the other things that i heard you talking about and i'm sure you're not alone um, I'm sure a lot of other MSPs are facing this, even at different stages is like almost, it, it sounds to me like growth challenges, mm-hmm. right? Like I can identify with in my career, um, parts where like everything's humming, right? Mm-hmm. You get to a point, everything's good. And then that thing breaks over there and you're like, but that was working or like, you know, <laughs> or we had enough people and now I need five more people. What happened? You know, yesterday, everything was fine. Um, and so there's like, when I, when I hit those kind of roadblocks or those hurdles, uh, I started to think about like, well, what are the constraints that I might have been operating in that mm-hmm. might no longer apply? So for example, I don't know, I mean, I'm not, I don't have all the answers, but uh, maybe, you know, the war for talent or finding good talent is hard, but maybe your customers, you know, expectations have gotten raised, at, right? How they have raised the bar. And so like the type of person you're looking for is more expensive. Yes. which might necessitate like a higher fee for the customer. Like there's like a mm-hmm. cascading set of constraints or assumptions that um, you, I'm sure you're already considering, but also apply like at every stage of an MSP growth or just company growth, right? Like what did I, what did I think, what did I believe was a constraint before that might no longer apply? Exactly. Right? exactly. The hours we operated, the salary I paid, how many people I needed on my team, how much I needed to invest in training. Um, and I think, you know, the, the people who succeed and grow are the ones who are willing to re-examine those things and open them up and say like, is this still working for me or not? And like find some creative solutions. The people who I think don't grow as fast or you know, t- struggle uh, to get there are the people who like hold on to like, no, I pay technicians this much. <laughs> and, you know, we only do nine to five, so we can't have customers uh, outside of that. Um, they, they they struggle because they're holding on to constraints that you know aren't serving them for growth, which which might be fine if they don't want to grow. But if they're yeah. trying to grow, our folks going to hold them back. Yeah, and 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 you mentioned the the um, the readjustment of the clients' fees because this is such a, a, a crucial element. The the constant communication with the clients, you as a client need to feel free to come to me and say, we're thinking about expanding our operational hours. Can you support me? And I should feel free as a provider to say, yes, I can do that. And that will require um, a readjustment on your monthly fee or whatever it is that you are providing as um, a a service for them. And I, I believe that maybe this is such a, a point that touches different areas within a company, but having that channel of communication always open with your team and with your clients as well makes such a difference because sometimes we think that our people need something to feel better at work, to work in a more enthusiastic way and feel more involved in in their jobs. Well, maybe they're they will need something completely different mm-hmm. and they would feel they would feel more motivated with something else that you haven't even considered and the same thing goes with the client having that channel always open working both ways so that we can give each other exactly what we need and not wasting energy and mm-hmm. and money on giving each other something that is not quite that and this sort of 
quite means that yes, you're okay, but we could feel better and we could be happier and we could work um, in a more engaged way. Uh, and and I feel that is this is hits right home because the with with clients it's harder to have that conversation because some of them believe that if you expand your hours that's not going to have an impact on the uh, on the the fees and they they think that everything is always included, included. <laughs> in the monthly all fee inclusive, and it's all, all you can eat buffet the all you can eat IT support, it's, uh, I think it's like the, the single pane of glass, the, the thing that everybody talks about, but it's this never is, gonna This happen. is almost like human nature though, right? Like to get more for less or to try to get a deal or all, all these things. But I think, you know, like you said, to have a healthy relationship between MSP or or provider, like if it's a vendor, whatever, uh, between two people, open it yeah. requires open communication. Otherwise you're guessing, right? Like exactly. what, can I, what should I provide for you? What will make you happy or, or, um, you know, what will satisfy your business needs? I don't know, unless we have a conversation about exactly. it. And that requires two ways, because you might have a standard package and it might work for a lot of people, but it might not necessarily work for a given customer or they might have slightly different needs. So Absolutely. Uh, and the guessing usually leaves one of two parties kind of disappointed because you don't feel that your needs are met, but uh, did you ever find a time to tell me what your needs were? <laughs> Have you ever find that sort of time to include me in your process making decision? But this goes also to the idea of an MSP that we need to take care of everything internally. This is, I think, something that we need to wrap our minds around. Even though our companies are functioning pretty well and we are kind of growing year to year or we are expanding our business, we should come together in an easier way and we should cooperate with each other to fulfill those ever-growing clients' needs. Because sometimes you cannot hire at the pace that the client might benefit from, but maybe you have another MSP that you can work with and right. that can support you in you know expanding your operations without having to hire and train a whole new set of technicians and right now i think this can make such a difference for a lot of small msps because coming together it's not it's not just that we are aiming for a merge or an acquisition it, those scary words you know those scary um actions that the bigger companies are telling us they are out there and everybody's doing it. It's not like you must merge with somebody or uh, acquire a company uh, or you need to be acquired. Sometimes you can just cooperate with another MSP that shares your same values and your same um, approach and your same mindset. And you can just help each other serving more clients and creating uh, a cohesive a uh, team that can exchange a favor when when the clients need it. And for us, for example, what you said before, the everything is working and all of a sudden this thing doesn't work anymore. Usually that happens on a Monday when everything was working until Friday night and the Monday yeah, right. morning. Or usually it breaks Saturday morning when you're trying to have your relaxing weekend. <laughs> exactly. And you've got those alerts on your phone, but you know that you're not supposed to call your team yeah. to fix those things. So yeah. you resist until Monday morning. And, and for us, it happened last month, yesterday, yesterday morning, the whole team came to the, to the office because we have, um, you know, we have some turns with the working from home schedule and half of them were dealing with emergencies because over the weekend, a few clients were experiencing some sort of emergency. And a colleague came to me and said, what can we do? Because today we would need five people more and say, okay, we cannot hire five people on the spot, but there's this MSP that I trust and that I worked with before. Let's call him and say, hey, we have this thing that we need to take care of today. Can you support us? And, and that's what we did. And it's just the sort of work friendship that 
we could benefit from instead of just focusing on the the hiring and the training internally. Um, this is also something that we need to look at from a different perspective compared to the traditional perspective because that doesn't work anymore. I don't think that we can hire everyone that we might need down the road, but we need to create a, a bigger network of MSPs that we can work with and that yeah. can help us uh, serve our yeah. clients in a better way. That makes a lot of sense. I think, you know, one one benefit of the pandemic is that it's definitely, uh, you know, uh, uh, made it clear to all small businesses that they need an MSP or they need someone to help them with their technol technical needs, right? Yes. Um, no, no business almost has gone untouched by the need to upgrade something or get online or, you know, fix some customer experience. So uh, the need for MSPs has just grown, which leads to then, you know, the growing pains for the MSP to hire, but also the expertise. Um, and like you said, you can't hire a person for every single, you know, software or need or project. Yes. Um, and partnering is, is going to be, I think, more important, like you said, whether you go officially like sort of with a provider or an official arrangement mm -hmm. or a more informal arrangement. I've seen that even with Synchro partners because of the pandemic, um, there are more and more MSPs that are remote from their, their clients. Yes. So they partner, you know, cross country to go on site and say, hey, I need someone to go on site. Can you do it? Or, exactly. you know, the MSP, MSSP partnerships, we see it very, very often. Um, I think that's one example of like a security specialization and an MSP partnering. But I think, like you said, there's more opportunity to partner on other things, not just security, but maybe coverage or special yes. projects or, you know, that kind of thing. And find the resources, the expertise that you need, not necessarily in, in your building, as we said, exactly. like in your staff, <laughs> but, but wherever but wherever you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that the remote part maybe is, is something that scares a lot of us. Uh, like one of the, the things that I wanted to ask you is how do you create that culture and how do you make a team um, close in between members of the team when you work in different places or you don't maybe don't even have a headquarter that you can refer to? Because for me, for, for my company, this is something that we are um, we are always wondering about, like, Right now, we should go beyond the idea of being close to each other to actually be close to each other. They, those do, two things, they, they're they not together um, all the time. Yeah. And if we develop the right culture within the company so that people can feel close to us without having to be close to us, maybe we can replicate that model when we work with another partner somewhere cross country or even in different countries. We have a few clients that have multiple um, offices around Europe and working with MSPs all across Europe would be incredibly helpful for us because we could have a network of people that we can trust and they can actually go on site to the client. But the, the working with a, a full remote team seems easier said than done. <laughs> yeah, it has benefits, like you said, too, apart from just expansion and partnership opportunities, you can hire talent in more places, right? So it makes hiring a bit easier. Uh, maybe it doesn't solve the problem entirely, but you have an expanded pool to hire from. So as a remote company, um, and having worked with like work from home policies before and that kind of thing, I think, um, you know, one thing that we found at Synchro is, and you're not going to like this because it's another hiring constraint, but really um, we, number one at the hiring stage, make sure it's someone who's going to be happy working remotely because mm -hmm. not everybody yes. uh, is suited for it or understands what they're getting into. Yes. So it helps. We have a list of actually like personality traits or outlook basically like approach to work that we look for. So are they optimistic in nature? Are they self-motivated? Do they like learning on their own? Because when you're at home, you don't, you can't tap somebody on the shoulder. You need to not be discouraged 
when you hit a, a barrier or you hit, hit a limit, you need to know how to reach out for help or what resource to go to. Um, and you need to be motivated to do that and overcome that challenge. So uh, we look for that, first of all, in the hiring phase. And then I think once, you know, they're employees, one way that we keep the culture is um, clarity of mission, mm. vision, and values. Um, because, you know, you have to, there's no physical location to bring people together. Like this is our commonality, right? We go to this physical space. We have to have a common kind of cultural space that we understand and define and hold each other accountable to, right? So I think that's really important. The cultural, the definition of the cultural space is kind of the re the replacement for the physical space, that yes. otherwise we would share. So a lot of it is kind of, in my mind, is trying to find parallels in, in a virtual world, but yes. the things you take for granted in a physical world. And I know a lot of companies, again, broader than MSP space, are, um, are, are challenged by this notion right now of remote work or hybrid work and you know, trying to get people to come back to the office. And um, as a remote company, it's interesting. I have no, I have no <laughs> office. I couldn't make people go to an office even if I wanted to. There's no, place there's to no office. Just start there's not even a WeWork or like a temp. There's no space anywhere. There's a PO box that we could all not fit in. Um, so, so um, you know, we have to, I, I look at, you know, the struggle and I think there's struggles on both sides. There's struggles of having a physical space. There's struggles of having a remote Mm. only company and it's just i think people are uncomfortable or or struggling more with the remote space and converting because they're not used to yes. the struggles and they have to adapt but if you think about it there's just as many struggles with physical space like limitations on where you can hire commuting and traffic time spent um, you know cost of providing snacks and the rent and the like there's cost of the business there's all these things yes. Meeting room conflicts. There's never enough meeting rooms. <laughs> All these things that, like, when you go virtual, they just disappear. But yeah. you, have, you know, they're replaced with other problems that you have to solve. Um, so, so back to the back to the topic. Cultural space definition is really important. Um, and then, you know, we also try to get together in person. Mm. Uh, there's just no substitute for it. So having an all company trip or having departmental offsites or exec um, team retreats. Uh, all of those things are important periodically to sort of maintain and build the trust uh, that you, it's just hard to get otherwise. Um, but yeah, that, those are some of the foundation. Do you think there's a, uh, a difference of the way that those things are perceived based on the age of the people that you involve? Like younger, yeah, yeah, younger than us. I, I need to say that younger than us. I I have coworkers. You're the second person to call me old this week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably myself old. I have coworkers that don't remember because they were not even born when Italy switched from its own currency to euro. Uh -huh. This is how young they are. They don't remember. We won the 2006. Uh, soccer world cup and they don't remember it and i was outside celebrating so this is the kind of age gap that we have within the company yeah i don't know that i, I don't know how i have, have an answer i i hear what you're saying there's like a different generation that grew up um that you know takes the internet for granted <laughs> like, you know didn't live without email and all those things and and social networks um so i do think that's a different frame of reference but I think they even more so are searching for purpose and like the, the way that they approach work life is very different. It is. And they're it even is. more so searching for purpose and meaning and fulfillment um, from work than prior generations. Yes. Um, so that's an interesting because uh, and it's interesting because I think human connection under underlying everything, human connection is what provides that purpose and meaning. Even in a business transaction, when you're serving a client, the underlying purpose or mission or belief is that like I'm providing value to somebody else and helping them, yes. right? So I I don't know. I think I think they found ways. I think the new you know the the younger kids have found ways <laughs> to find and derive that meaning without face to face interaction. Yes. But I think they probably still need it. <laughs> maybe they don't realize it. Maybe, yes, maybe they don't realize it. They need it, definitely, because they need to also, I think this is part of the training, uh, learning how to behave in a work environment, in a physical work environment, 
dealing, um, learning how to interact with coworkers, how to manage your time during a meeting, or how to respect each other um, um, spaces. Like there are people who thrive in constant communication and exchange with coworkers. Other people that work better when they are more isolated in a silent environment and they don't want to be interrupted that often. So I think those are personal um, personality traits that we need to take in consideration. But what we thought was a benefit in a, a physical work environment, you know, the, the, the coffee and the snacks and the um, relaxed room, whatever that was, the younger generation is not that impressed. Like mm-hmm. they don't, they couldn't care less about the snacks. <laughs> <laughs> They're okay with bringing the protein shakes from home, and 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 that's that's good for them. And that goes back to the communication. What do you need from yes. the work environment? What can I what can I do for you? What can I provide you to make you feel more engaged? And and what can help you work in a more um, enthusiastic way day in and day out because sometimes we waste our energies replicating a model that the newer generation is not that attracted by they they want something and different. it goes back to that co- constraints of growth right so we're tying exactly I think that we're, we're getting to an end in our conversation <laughs> i was wondering like how are we going to get to an end we can talk all day but we tied it all together here so it's about re-examining the assumptions about what are benefits and what are perceived benefits in this new way of working um similar to how you know you need to re-examine those when your business is growing uh, and I think, you know, I've done a ton of talking uh, in the last couple of years, especially, but even before that, about social issues at work. Mm. And that, I think, is another way that, um, you know, work, the work environment is changing and the work culture is changing to help people find meaning. Yes. Um, and also challenging this whole, you know, profitability assumption or efficiency assumption, like, why should we talk about these things at work? That doesn't really, you know, have ROI, does it? Um, but you know, I, for one, find a ton of value in improving myself, uh, and learning at work about a wide range of issues. Um, and so I think that is a trend that I don't think will stop anytime soon. It's a way that I think the next generation is finding meaning at work is that it's not just about the, the task at hand, exactly it's about a broader, uh, purpose. And it's, a um, it's considering our themselves and we should consider ourselves like a whole, we are not just the work persona and then we when we go back home we are the family keep your hat off (laughs) there's just one hat and the the idea that we should be different at at work than we are at home yes of course we have more um social uh you know constraints when we are at work we don't talk to each other the way that we talk to our friends yes of course but we are the same person and um i was talking to a, a co-worker today and what I said was, I don't believe in the whole leave your problems back at home, because if you have real issues, it's going to be super difficult to come to work and forget about them. It's not that I can fix everything in your life, or maybe I, sh- I, I shouldn't even think about that. But for whatever is in my power, I'm going to do everything for you. Like if you're going to confide in me and if you're going to ask me for help and support, if, if it's something that I can do, I will do it because the way that you feel and the way that you are in your personal time has a direct impact on the way that you work. And maybe even in those revenues, in those ROIs and, and in the, the profit that we're all chasing when people are distracted and stressed at home for whatever reason it is, they're not going to work in a, in a most the most efficient way. So there's this responsibility of, again, keeping the communication open and let our team feel and and trust and believe that we are going to do whatever we can for them and that we have their best interest at heart because together we can make our lives better and the company that we work within better. So it's, it's just, it goes back to talking 
sharing um, whatever we feel comfortable yeah. sharing being flexible too and being willing to take risks and experiment right with yes. new things that we might not have tried before or we might not have even considered you know like you said partnering with other msps to deliver a service maybe that was you know off the table or so, an idea we didn't even think about but hey, let's try it out and see if it works. Similarly, when employees ask for flexible time or exactly. work from home or whatever, uh, we need to try it out um, and see. Maybe it, maybe it will work, maybe it won't. But uh, being open to the possibility, I think, is important. Absolutely, yes. I, I think that our conversation, <laughs> they're always too short. <laughs> There's so many things that I want to ask you, but I, I, I don't want to take too much of your early morning because I know that you have so many things to do and for me it's just the afternoon so my my day is going in the slower part uh, but for you it's Good. just the beginning. I know I'm just getting started but yeah. yes always a pleasure to talk to you Vera. You too. Hey, Richard Tubb here to thank you for listening to this very special episode of Tub Talk featuring Vera Tucci and Emily Glass. If you've enjoyed this episode, then I'd strongly encourage you to listen to Tub Talk episode 98, where I speak to Vera Tucci about co-managed IT, cybersecurity and imposter syndrome. And also Tub Talk episode 115, where I speak to Emily Glass about why a more human business better serves MSPs. Now, if you'd like to continue the conversation with either Emily, Vera or myself, then visit www.tublog.co.uk for all the show notes for this episode. And remember, you can download our Women in Tech ebook for free by visiting tub.co forward slash women in tech. Thanks to Vera and Emily for being amazing guest hosts for today's episode. And we'll see you back here for another Tub Talk episode very soon. Hey team, this is Richard again. Just one more thing before you take off, and that is MSP Insights. Now, every Tuesday, I share my thoughts on the business of IT with you, the managed service community. Thousands of managed service providers already subscribe to MSP Insights. It's easy to sign up, easy to cancel. MSP Insights is basically a short email from me every Tuesday without fail with advice on growing your IT business, plus cool resources I found, discovered, or started exploring that week. It's kind of like my diary of cool things and often includes articles or books I've read, tools I've discovered and events I think you'd be interested in, often sent to me by my friends and Tub Talk podcast guests. So if that sounds fun, a short tiny bite of MSP goodness every Tuesday and you'd like to try it out, just go to go.tub.co forward slash Tuesday. That's gogo.tub.co forward slash Tuesday. Drop in your email and you'll get the very next one. Thanks for listening.